Hello, everyone. Uh, I don't know who chooses the music, but I'm going to express myself. Hello. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about a very depressing statistic. Um, Tom talked a little bit about it at the beginning of the day. And then we heard um, Matt and Chris talk a little bit about it. But less than 20% of startups succeed. And the number one reason is a lack of product market fit. Why? Maybe people don't know the market. My guess is that in this kind of analysis-driven world, that's probably not the case. It's probably more around empathy for users, a lack of empathy for users. But I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm actually going to talk about the fact that we often put so much emphasis on an emphasis for empathy for users that we forget to have empathy for our employees. And I'm going to argue that actually empathy for employees is perhaps more important to creating scale and innovation than empathy for users and customers. I'm Emily Kolker, as you heard. Um, I have had experience working in, I worked in Silicon Valley. I know you've seen a lot of that today. Uh, for a long time, I worked with um, small startups, mid-stage startups. I sold a startup, worked for a big company. Um, I'm now the MD of IDEO. IDEO, for those of you who don't know, is an innovation company. We use human-centered design to help big organizations change and transform so that they can innovate on an ongoing basis. Audiences, so we talked a little bit about users, a little bit about employees. These are probably the three primary audiences that you think about as a startup CEO, a startup founder. Customers, the people who give you money. Investors, the people who back you so that you can get money from those customers. And employees, and if we're really honest, it's probably in that order. This is probably the set of people who you think less about. Sometimes you think about them, but maybe really when you get uh, a complaint from your partner, some message from your kids. And this person is the person you probably think even least about. It's a really strange thing because you probably feel like you're always thinking about yourself, never get away from yourself, always thinking about your to-do list, and yet you don't focus on yourself. And the reason I bring this up is because I'm going to share with you three themes that continually come up when I talk to startup founders, and I've run two accelerators since working within start startups myself. And each of those themes require you to change your mindset, your behavior, and the way you operate. So this is all about you. First theme, number one, letting go. How familiar is this to you? I just don't have time to train anybody else. Frankly, with all humility, I can probably do it better myself. Or I just feel responsible. I have the vision. I know what's needed. I completely understand all of those things. And to use a rather cheesy analogy, um, when you drop a stone in water, you all know that you get that concentric circle ripple effect. Very good. When you skip a stone across water, you get a much wider ripple effect. It's the same thing when we think about concentrated and distributed power. No matter what, when you see this, scale only happens when you disperse responsibilities. And this is something that you have to commit to. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, I met recently with, uh, actually it was about six months ago, but I spoke to him a couple days ago when I was in San Francisco, with the CEO of an ed tech startup. Brilliant guy. 11 employees, doing really well, super excited about the next product version, favorable press mentions, low level of consistent anxiety, to-do list as long as I am. Um, and so we were really struggling, and we talked a lot about kind of what he was prioritizing and why he was choosing to prioritize each of those items instead of other things. And I, I said to him, you kind of just need to let go. Uh, I know that sounds like an emotional journey, and that's why I'm telling this story, and it is emotional. But at the end of the day, letting go is going to be the most beautiful thing you can do, and it's going to free you up to sleep incredibly well, the way that Matt talked about not sleeping when you're sucking your thumb at the end of the bed. Uh, and so when I spoke to him a couple days ago, um, what he said is he'd spoken to two employees. And the feedback that he had gotten from those employees was really fundamental. It was the fact that as he was feeling that low level of anxiety, which he thought he was masking really well, it was actually affecting everybody else. And there was no incentive for his employees to do more work or better work 
because they thought he was just going to redo that work anyway. So I'm going to give you three suggestions of practical actions. You know, when I used to come to these talks and when I still come to these talks, uh, A, I always think you need to be a little bit funny. Even if I'm not funny, at least the GIF is. Um, and two, three, you need to, and you also need to walk away with practical things. So number one, commit to letting go of one thing and passing it on to other people. It doesn't matter what that thing is. A people issue, an operations issue, an admin issue, product, whatever it is, commit six months minimum. Commit to six months, and I promise you, you will feel a hell of a lot freer. Number two, it's hard to pass the baton on. It, it is. Um, sometimes you have to apply a little bit of false humility. I know you can do this better than me. Honestly, I have confidence in you. Fake it until you make it. We're all faking it. Fake it until you make it. But commit and apply that humility if you need to. The last thing is, what frequently happens is when you've asked somebody else to do something for you, when you get it back, your natural instinct is to criticize it. Not because you don't think it's good, but simply because you think you probably could have done it better. Be curious. I promise you, you'll be surprised. Constantly surprised when people come back and they've done things differently or they've landed on a different result. It can be incredibly invigorating and you will learn. Okay, theme number two. Moving from motivating yourself to motivating others. This is a really hard one, and it's especially hard if you're the founder of your startup. Um, a lot of people call their companies their baby, which made me think of two weekends ago. If you have kids, and if you don't, imagine this. When you attend your friend's kids' amateur dance recital, it is not as interesting or motivating as if it is your kid's dance recital. Your kids, oh my god, I could sit through hours of this. Somebody else's kids, really? Really? It's the same with employees. I'm sorry, but they are never going to care about your company as much as you do. Doesn't matter if they believe in the mission. Doesn't matter if you are the most inspirational leader. They will not care about your company as much as you do. So, how do you motivate others? There are loads and loads of articles about the merits of reward and recognition. Those are all good, but I think it has to be genuine. Matt talked a little bit about this. Personally, I'm not about ping pongs and pool tables, but that can be genuine and authentic to others. So I'm going to give you a separate story, and this is, um, I know there's a lot of popularity around Brene Brown and vulnerability right now. This is somewhat along the same themes, but it's very true. Um, a few weeks ago was Mental Health Awareness Week, and a good friend of mine, uh, who is a senior executive at a very large company, sent me a blog post she was considering posting about her experience with cancer and depression this year. And she was really torn because she knew it would make a statement for a senior leader to share something so personal. And yet at the same time, it was so personal and it would really expose her. She posted it. This is the text that I received from her. Had the most incredible response to my blog. People sharing their own experience, thanking me for my openness and honesty. It's been really humbling. I'm very glad I did it. Whether you want to believe it or not, regardless of the size of your company, when you are a leader, people have a hard time relating to you. And it only gets harder. They will judge you. They will be uh, uncomfortable around you. They will admire you. They will want to emulate you. Sometimes motivating others is about being vulnerable. Sometimes it's about being brave. Sometimes it's about stepping to the back of the room and letting somebody else be at the front of the room. What this illustrates to me is that we're all human. And it's only that when we show our humanity that we are relatable. That is one of the most powerful ways to motivate people. My three tips, I'm running low on time. Number one, check your ego at the door. Recognize that not everybody has as much to gain from your company as you do. Number two, really understand your employees. If they are the types of people who love pool tables and ping pong tables, great. At IDEO, we are a bunch of very curious designers. So how do we motivate? We motivate through inspiration. I met with a FinTech a couple days ago. Uh, they are motivated by money. That's fine. Understand your employees and motivate based on the size and shape of your employees. Be brave. The payoff, 
I promise you, people will follow you from company to company. Last theme that comes up over and over again, it's the culture piece. We've talked about it a little bit today, we've heard about it. It's relatively abstract. Um, the way that I describe culture personally is what people say about where they work when they are not at work, whether it's to their granny, their friends, their family, whatever. And if you are really honest, if you ask yourself, if you were a fly on the wall, what would people say about where they work? If your company is 10 people or smaller, probably they'll say something pretty similar. Any bigger than that, you will be shocked by what they say. A little bit of science, a little bit of maths. Dunbar's number. Those of you who read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, he talked about cults uh, over the period of time where whenever a cult gets to 150, and this is consistent across every group that you come across, they can no longer organically survive. They need stewardship. It's the same thing for a company. I was talking to a former colleague um, recently about an another colleague that she had who was incredibly bright, uh, really well respected in the external community, absolutely disliked internally. She, were, she held grudges. She belittled people on her team in front of others. She spoke shit about her boss. Oh, I hope I can say that. She spoke shit about her boss. Um, and finally, we, we asked her to leave, or they asked her to leave, and uh, seven people said in their exit interviews that they chose to leave the company because of her. And when she left, the relief was palpable amongst this department of 300 people. What strikes me about this conversation is the fact that while it takes a whole company to build a culture, it is not top down and it is not purely bottom up. The amount of energy expended on this toxicity, on this person, instead of on the right people, on your future leaders on the high potentials, is just so unacceptable. It takes one person to poison a culture, yet it takes the whole set of employees to build that culture in a sustained fashion. And for those of you who are a little bit more rational, I'm a data nerd, um, there are loads and loads of studies that will show you that when you have a poor culture, there are terrible effects on absenteeism, productivity, performance, cost of acquisition of employees, as well as customers. And the truth is that the upside is as big. You will get gains of 41% in a reduction of absenteeism when you have a great culture. You will get gains of 21% when you of profitability when you have a great culture. This is not some fluffy stuff. And the truth is, most CEOs, most startup founders see culture as a cost. And I want to guarantee you, and I promise you, come and find me. You can fight with me about this. I'm going to be on a stage doing a Q&A shortly. The return on your investment when you see culture as an investment and not as a cost will far outweigh the money that you spend on it. So that's my number one tip. See culture as an investment, not as a cost. Number two. Address toxicity quickly, like my, um, colleague, my former colleague. But have direct conversations. Give feedback. Give people a chance. And when you do dismissals, do it with decency. And lastly, culture is not something that's done when you've got values on your walls, as I see all too often. Culture is living and breathing and something that you have to always, always focus on. Three things I talked about. I ran over a little bit. I apologize. Um, number one, let go. It is the only way to scale. Number two, move from motivating yourself, you're intrinsically motivated, to motivating others. You provide the conditions for people to take risks. Risks leads to innovation. Number three, actively focus on culture. Never, ever take your foot off the pedal. See it as an investment, not as a cost. Thank you so much. I'll be doing a Q&A at 11.30. I really appreciate your time.